This video will cover the countercurrent multiplier system in the kidneys. By the end of this video, you will have gained an understanding of how the majority of water that is reabsorbed by the kidneys is reabsorbed, and how the countercurrent multiplier system works. Number 1. The countercurrent refers to the current in the loop of Henle. The countercurrent multiplier system is a means by which the kidneys reabsorb water. 70 to 90 percent of water that is reabsorbed by the kidneys is reabsorbed through the countercurrent multiplier system. The specific current that is mentioned in the countercurrent multiplier is the current of the fluid that has been filtered out of the blood, known as filtrate, as it passes through the loop of Henle. Recall that the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule are connected by the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle consists of the descending limb and the ascending limb. This is the site where water is reabsorbed in the countercurrent multiplier. The descending limb is permeable to water, meaning water can flow through the wall of the descending limb of the loop of Henle and flow into the interstitial fluid of the cells of the kidneys. The descending limb is not permeable to solutes, meaning nothing but water can flow out of the descending limb of the loop of Henle. The ascending limb, on the other hand, is permeable to solutes, such as sodium ions, but is not permeable to water. This means that as filtrate passes through the loop of Henle, water is able to leave the loop of Henle in the descending limb, but not the ascending limb. Solutes are not able to leave the loop of Henle in the descending limb, but are able to leave the loop of Henle in the ascending limb. Number 2. An osmotic gradient is the basis of the countercurrent multiplier system. For more information on osmosis and an explanation of an osmotic gradient and osmolarity, see our video on this channel covering osmosis. The filtrate in the proximal convoluted tubule has an osmolarity of about 300 milliosmoles. The interstitial fluid on the other side of the wall of the proximal convoluted tubule also has an osmolarity of about 300 milliosmoles. This means that there is no net gain in water reabsorption from the filtrate into the interstitial fluid, as there is no osmotic gradient. In order for water to be moved out of the filtrate and into the interstitial fluid, an osmotic gradient must be established. In order to establish an osmotic gradient, the concentrate of solute must be higher on one side of the wall of the tubule than the other. In the case of the countercurrent multiplier system, the concentration of solute in the interstitial fluid surrounding the loop of Henle is greatly increased as compared to the concentration of solute inside the loop of Henle. This establishes an osmotic gradient. Since the osmolarity in the interstitial fluid is greater than the osmolarity inside the loop of Henle, an osmotic gradient exists. The reason it is so crucial to ensure the osmolarity in the interstitial fluid is higher than in the descending limb of the loop of Henle is that it is the descending limb of the loop of Henle that is permeable to water. Therefore, by establishing an osmotic gradient with a higher solute concentration immediately outside the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water will diffuse out of the descending limb of the loop of Henle and into the interstitial fluid. The key to ensuring water flows out of the filtrate and is reabsorbed is to have an osmotic gradient outside the descending limb of the loop of Henle that favors reabsorption. However, as water leaves the descending limb and filtrate moves further down the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the osmolarity inside the descending limb is increased. This is because as water leaves the loop of Henle and enters the interstitial fluid, the concentration of solute inside the descending limb increases. This is not because there is more solute added, but because the same amount of solute in less water indicates a higher osmolarity. Thus, as water leaves the descending limb of the loop of Henle, the solute that remains in the descending limb are in a continually decreasing volume of water. This continually increases the osmolarity in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. In order for reabsorption to occur, an osmotic gradient must continually be established. This means that interstitial fluid outside the loop of Henle must continually increase its osmolarity, ensuring its osmolarity is always higher than the osmolarity of the filtrate in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. For this purpose, as the osmolarity of the filtrate in the descending limb increases, the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid continually increases, until finally, at the lowest portion of the descending limb of the loop of Henle, 
The osmolarity of the filtrate is at its greatest with an osmolarity of approximately 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. The interstitial fluid at this point contains an osmolarity of approximately 1,400 milliosmoles per liter. By keeping up with the changes in osmolarity in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water is able to be reabsorbed from the filtrate all along the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Water reabsorption only stops once the filtrate reaches the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, which is not permeable to water. Number 3. Active transport of solutes establishes the osmotic gradient. Sodium ions, potassium ions, and chloride ions are all actively transported across the wall of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and into the interstitial fluid. This active transport of solutes means the solutes are transported against their concentration gradient, from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. By doing this, the osmotic gradient that allows for water reabsorption is established. The high concentration of solutes in the interstitial fluid surrounding the loop of Henle is the result of the active transport of solutes out of the filtrate in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. This also decreases the osmolarity of the filtrate in the ascending limb. This decrease of osmolarity of the filtrate in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle is not due to an increase in the volume of water in the ascending limb, as the ascending limb does not allow for movement of water in or out of the ascending limb. Rather, as solutes are transported out of the filtrate, their concentration in the filtrate decreases. This decreased concentration of solute results in a decreased osmolarity of the filtrate as it passes through the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. When filtrate passes from the loop of Henle and enters the distal convoluted tubule, the osmolarity is approximately 200 milliosmoles. While this is much lower than the osmolarity in the interstitial fluid, it is important to remember that water cannot flow down its concentration gradient and into the interstitial fluid, as the ascending limb is not permeable to water. Thus, there is no risk of water moving in or out of the loop of Henle in the ascending limb. The countercurrent multiplier only needs to ensure osmolarity is greater in the interstitial fluid surrounding the descending limb, not the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, for the transport of water. Number 4. The vasa recta allows for reabsorption into the blood. Two questions commonly arise at this point of understanding the mechanisms behind the countercurrent multiplier system. Is the water reabsorbed into the blood or only into the interstitial fluid? The second question is, after the water has moved into the interstitial fluid, wouldn't this decrease the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid and abolish the osmotic gradient? The answer to both of these questions lies in the vasa recta. The vasa recta is a network of capillaries that surrounds the kidneys. As concentrations of solutes increase in the interstitial fluid, the solutes are then able to diffuse into the blood in the vasa recta. This means blood in the vasa recta has a high osmolarity, which induces water to diffuse into the vasa recta as well. Since water diffuses into the blood in the vasa recta, it is no longer present in the interstitial fluid, and thus cannot decrease the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid. However, this diffusion of solute into the blood does not put an end to the countercurrent multiplier, as solute is continually transported from the filtrate into the interstitial fluid. Therefore, as solute diffuses from the interstitial fluid into the vasa recta, more solute from the filtrate has already been transported into the interstitial fluid, maintaining the concentration gradient necessary for water reabsorption to occur. Similarly, as water diffuses out of the descending limb of the loop of Henle and into the interstitial fluid, it does not remain in the interstitial fluid, but only passes through as the water continues to diffuse into the vasa recta. Since the water does not remain but passes through the interstitial fluid, the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid is relatively constant. The key to understanding how water is transported from the loop of Henle into the blood is to understand that water reabsorption is a dynamic process and that molecules of water and solute are constantly moving into the interstitial fluid and then the blood. 
This allows for water and solute to both be reabsorbed from the filtrate and into the blood. While the countercurrent multiplier system allows for an osmotic gradient in the interstitial fluid, the interstitial fluid is not a final destination for the solute molecules or the water. Rather, the countercurrent multiplier only draws water and solute out of the filtrate to then allow them to diffuse into the blood and be fully reabsorbed. Science of Human Physiology